so yeah, uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I am Jesse. I am a developer outreach person. Uh, I don't have the title developer relations or advocate or anything fancy these days. I've been given more a general directive. My prime directive is developer outreach these days for Hazura. Um, and I'm going to be kind of explaining who Hazura is and what it does tonight. But uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. I've been in developer outreach for a while. I kind of have focused in the GraphQL space. Uh, I did some, some time at another company called GraphCMS. And yeah, I, I think if you go to my Twitter bio, which is at Motley Dev, you'll see that I describe myself as I am paid to ask the stupid questions. So if there are any questions in the audience today, uh, I will make this a very like informative or casual chat. So if there are any questions along the way, do definitely uh, pound that Q&A and I will, I have no agenda other than a few slides and just kind of showing the, the backside of what it is that the slides were supposed to say in the first place. So we'll go ahead and kind of have, have at it here. I'm going to share my screen. I think I need permission to do such. If I see that correctly. Let's see if we can do that for you. So um, are we sure you? I'm wondering if panelists are limited when it comes to screen sharing. Let's see if I can make you a host. That's dangerous. <laughs> Change host. <laughs> There you go, Jesse. Right, so, I think you're a host now. Right. Can you see if you can? Yeah, share I, can, I see that I can do that now. So let me go ahead and do that and I will share slides. All right, so you should be able to see a slide deck. Is that correct? Looks good. All right, so the talk here today is front end frameworks, back end databases, and GraphQL. I was handed this topic and told to. Uh, interpret it <laughs> as I will. So this is my first time actually giving this specific talk. And so what I'm wanting to do today is really kind of talk through specifically the role of GraphQL. And as you see that I've added to the bottom piece that according to Hazura, I think that there's a lot of confusion in the industry in terms of the GraphQL consumers as to what Hazura is even doing and what kind of a product it actually is. It's an open source tool. It does have a cloud component, but it's an open source tool. It's got a lot of power and I just kind of wanted to talk through a little bit what it's actually doing. I'll talk a little bit about what GraphQL is, but I kind of wanted to explain what is this tool and, and where does it fit into the space? And uh, then also kind of maybe how, how some of these pieces play together. So without uh, delaying any further, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the first slide here. So essentially what we need to look at when we're looking at this topic is that GraphQL is sitting in the middle between your backend databases and front end frameworks. And if there is like, if this is a, uh, everybody here's a GraphQL expert, I apologize. There's only a few, what is GraphQL slides? Uh, but it's basically GraphQL is this technology that sits in between the client, whatever the client may be. In a lot of cases, it's the front end framework and your back end database. But to really understand that, then we do actually have to understand what is GraphQL as a technology itself. And so what you ultimately have with GraphQL is you've got essentially type definitions that you then map to things that are called resolvers. And then you put those together into what's called a schema. And then you're able to actually query from that. So I'm gonna kind of talk through each of these parts here. So a type definition, if you've done any kind of TypeScript work or you've worked with any type languages, it's pretty standard, pretty something you've probably seen before. You essentially are defining your data model. You're, you're going in here and I always use beer as my uh, examples for everything that I, I talk about in tech, but you have a say this type here that's called type beer and you can give it some properties, the name, the ABV, the IBU, the clarity. Uh, and then you can make relations between these things. So you've got uh, the brewery is relation to this other type called brewery. Uh, you can have an ability to have you know, enumerables and things of that nature. All of those types then get uh, basically chained into a master type or a primary type definition. And that would be the root query type. And that root query type is essentially where your entry point to your entire API when it comes to GraphQL. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit further as we go along here. So what you have then at the, the top levels, you have this type definition. In this case, I have my individual types. 
And then to make that do anything, you need to have resolvers that are going to be fetching that data for you. In this case, this is a generic JavaScript function that maybe is living somewhere else inside of your, your tech stack. Uh, and it's performing a function called get all beers, simply doing whatever a data lookup in your system might be and resolving that data for you. So you have a type definition and you have a resolver behind it that's fetching that content and returning it to you. Uh, and then what you're allowed, what you get then on top of that is then this actual query language. And so a lot of times when people say GraphQL, they think of it as this specific querying syntax. And it's more than that. It's the whole, it's the whole uh, specification of having a type, having resolvers, having a schema, and then having specific requirements, what those need to do. And then this language that allows you to query your data. Uh, from that system. So you'd have something kind of like this, you tell what kind of a, a operator you want to execute here. So we'll do a query instead of a mutation, fetching beers. And then you can see where GraphQL really starts to shine is based on that relational property. You have something like brewery here where you can actually uh, nest your request for, for whatever external data you would like. It's a very relational graph-like querying uh, system. I'm going pretty fast in this GraphQL stuff. So if there's something that's a question, definitely feel free to stop. I'm assuming a lot of people at this point have had some exposure to GraphQL. So I'm just going to keep, keep moving unless I see somebody uh, complain. <laughs> um, and so what we have then with GraphQL, if you put it all together, essentially, and the most important part to know about GraphQL is that it is a spec. And it's, uh, what that means is that it's ultimately technology agnostic, right? So there's not actually a specific uh, language or framework that you need to use to build out a GraphQL uh, compliant server. You can build this in Go, you can build this in Rust, you can build this in like any language out there. Uh, and a lot of times it kind of gets picked up by the JavaScript crowd because it's something that's pretty popular. Uh, uh, GraphQL was kind of born out of a, a Facebook need and there was React there. So there's kind of this language that all sort of went together. But Graph, uh, GraphQL itself is a specification. Um, so anyways, we'll have the, uh, so it's a technology agnostic thing. It essentially functions as kind of an informal data contract between your backend and your front end because you have this type system in place that allows you to be able to understand what your, your backing data is. Your front end framework can make some assumptions about what data is expecting back from the server. And that's primarily uh, a benefit of it being a strongly typed specification. So going back to this type system, it's something that's strongly typed and it's introspectable or discoverable. And this is one of the key components of a GraphQL server. And this is one of the reasons why GraphQL has kind of had the explosion of, of consumption that it has. It has this idea of an introspection query that when you run this very specially formatted query, it will give you all the data about that API. Now there's some security implications there about when or when not to hide that. <laughs> so you don't wanna have a data disclosure problem where you're you know, revealing some sort of R&D project on your API. But in terms of the tooling that you're using to build your, your projects with, having your system be able to go out and introspect that query and know about your entire API and all the data models that it has available, plus all the fields, is a really powerful contract between the front end and the back end. This is where GraphQL really starts to shine. It's because you have this ability to say, like from the, from the type hintings and from everything else inside of your IDE, you can say, what am I looking for? Or what else, what other data do I have available here? And you have that sort of a connection to your, your system. So that's kind of where GraphQL has really started to take off. And it's part of what actually is also makes it more of an evergreen, uh, sort of an API layer. Because you have this idea of types, you don't have specific routes to your API. You have one, usually just one route, just the GraphQL endpoint. You don't have to worry about provisioning a lot of different API endpoints. You can implement a new type, you can implement a new resolver, and you can uh, deprecate old ones, and you're not having to worry about a lot of versioning or a lot of stale or brittle uh, endpoints starting to pollute your API space, you're able to say, this is like my one endpoint that I've delivered to everybody. And you can annotate those uh, models so that somebody down the road would see, oh, I've got a deprecation warning on this usage that I need to switch to something else. But it's not like, oh, I need to swap out all of my, end my, my API endpoints to something totally new.
I'm assuming that everybody's tracking with all of that at this point. So <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a, a high flyover of what GraphQL is. All right, good. <laughs> uh, so moving on then to uh, again, I wanted to talk a bit about what Hazura does, and Hazura is a GraphQL uh, client or or is a a data layer. I'm trying to. I want to talk about sort of the problem that GraphQL has created. And this is where then the Hazura part is trying to solve for. But when you have then the idea here is essentially GraphQL is this, is this you know, connection layer between your backend databases and your front end frameworks. It looks clean on paper. It's a very clean and, and tidy concept. But what you ultimately end up coming down to is you have whatever your framework of choices, you know, at the bottom. And then you've got all your backend databases on the other side. And in this bridge in between, you're writing just a lot of code that's trying to solve for a lot of uh, common problems. So you've got, let's say, a Postgres database you want to connect to. And then now you've got to basically write GraphQL resolvers and glue code for like queries, mutations, relations, RBAC controls, caching, data stitching. I mean, this, all these pieces that go into the modern application stack is what you're having to write by hand. <laughs> And, and as we all know, like the only, the term that we call that in the professional industry is that's, that's boilerplate. So we don't like writing boilerplate and a boilerplate is basically just abstracting where our brittle code lives. We're not necessarily shipping a brittle API layer, but now we've got a whole bunch of spaghetti code all over the place trying to implement these different pieces. And it's, it's kind of missing some of the power and some of the opportunities we have here when we're looking at using things like a strongly typed specification and having uh, tools that are like infinite amount of tools in the database space to be able to introspect what the schemas are for databases. And this is where Hazura has tried to sort of come in as they've said, you know what? What we could do is we could take a database uh, that's provided to us and we can sort of like look at that and make some assumptions about the tables we see about the permissions we see, about the different roles we see and the foreign keys and all of that, we can look at all of that and we can actually generate the APIs, the GraphQL resolvers for that. And we can actually do that really fast because we know like there's best practices around writing just straight up SQL code against this database. Like Postgres is what we started with. Uh, so we can say, we know how to write really fast abstracted SQL queries for basically any table. And so there's no, you know, compiler time. There's no additional database lookup time. It's literally this resolver is being converted directly to an SQL statement and dragging directly out of the database. And so Hazura said, like, we can take this kind of best of both worlds. We do this generated API, give the user some control about what they do and don't want to track or expose in the API from that database add some manual configurations in there as well, where the customer can kind of override stuff or make some other pieces like, you know, event-driven programming triggers and, and actions and whatnot, and not actually have to write that code. So it becomes sort of a low, a, sort of a low op kind of tooling where we're able to say, just put in the database and we get all of these, these tables on top. So it's a really powerful concept leveraging the benefit of what GraphQL has in terms of strongly typed specifications and the databases that we have behind it. And so as we've, we've developed out this layer that handles a lot of these different features and whatnot, and again, it's an open source tool, but as we developed out a lot of these, this layer of different you know, data layer services and features, we started realizing that, well, actually we can go well beyond just the, you know, the Postgres space. We can do that same, that same sort of abstraction for BigQuery, for SQL Server, for Mariah, for um, like a whole bunch of databases. And so that's actually the current vision now and the current uh, roadmap that Hazur is on is that we're taking uh, this knowledge we've gained on the adapting features such as mutations, such as event triggers and whatnot from the Postgres space where we started and now we're actually adapting those so that today you've got the ability to do queries out of BigQuery. You've got mutations and queries, subscriptions on a SQL Server. We have full support for Citus and we're adding just more and more databases all the time so that whatever database you have, if you want to like benefit from GraphQL, 
you drop in the database, you get all these automatically generated resolvers for you. It's never touching your root data, it's like the tables and all the structure stays in place, but you get this API like right out of the box. So really, really powerful concept and it makes for a very great developer experience. And ultimately the goal is, as we start to even work with creating these database to database type joins and the ability to make relationships between your data sources, the whole goal is to ultimately be able to essentially abstract away your interaction with the data layer at all. So your sysops person comes in, stands up a Hazura instance, whether it's going to be a self-hosted version or, and I've added that on the slide there, uh, we have cloud available now as well. If they want to just stand up a Hazura instance, and then they'll be able to go ahead and say, um, like, this is the API, right? And so now the API is there and you're able to interact with it and whatever the database is or the specifics of the querying language for the different databases, like no longer a relevant concern for, for the front enders. So that's uh, kind of the nutshell of, of what Hazura is and where it's been. And I kind of wanted to show then a little bit about how it actually works. I'm gonna give sort of a five minute-ish flyby uh, overview of what it does. And then uh, maybe we'll be able to have some time for some Q and A. So definitely uh, load up some of those questions here. Uh, so let me go ahead and I wanna stop sharing this screen and share the next one. And I'm going to load up this one. All right, so what you should be seeing now is essentially a, uh, a dashboard for the Hazura console. And I'd yep. be curious, yeah, I'd be curious how, from questions or anybody inside of the chat to just mention if anybody actually has been using Hazura uh, and uh, it'd be fun to see. Um, so anyways, what we have here is I have, I've added a database already. And in my case, it's a simple uh, Heroku database, Postgres database. And I've added a couple of tables just as a way of starter example. But uh, what I have here is, is beer and a uh, user. And I apologize if anybody is, if, if have, has a problem with beer, um, then, then I can't help you anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so that's kind of the, the master, the primary database concept that I work with. But I have a, a, this whole list of different kinds of um, beer here. It just happens to be that they all mention America right yeah, now. So we, we, I love do have, we love beer. You love beer. It's great. I do have more uh, more cultured uh, options in this list as well, so just want to get that out of the way. Uh, I live in Germany, so I've got a I've got a lot of beer exposure. But uh, yeah, anyways, classic classic database type here. We got beer with a name and an image, uh, an ID. Don't ever do uh, incrementing IDs. By the way, terrible database model, but works well for <laughs> examples. And then what we have here is users, uh, which I don't have anybody added yet. Uh, I can have, I can easily add content here from uh, the from the system here. So I'll just you know add my myself here, or I can also do that from the API. I do see there's a question which I will answer here in one second, um, or I can you know add data from the GraphQL side where I can come in here and say mutation, and I'll do something like insert user, and you'll see that as I as I'm just typing, I'm getting this uh, hinting of what I can use. And that's all a benefit of that introspection query where I can say, okay, uh, I want to go insert user. And now I'll say on my objects, I'm going to uh, go ahead and look to see what I need to insert here. And if I'm ever not sure about what the data is required, I can click on these different um, API endpoints and see sort of this introspected uh, argument list of what's, what's required here. So it's saying objects is looking for a input here. So I'm going to give it this array syntax, which it actually doesn't totally need um, if it's just going to get one object. But I'll go ahead and say name and I'll go ahead and add uh, Jim. And then I need to give it some returning fields back from the database. So I've done an insert and then I need to tell it what I need to be bringing back. And so again, I'm using this introspection ability to see what kind of data is even available to me. I see that I can grab the ID and the name. And I can insert like that as well. And I get a <laughs> I get a error. What did I do wrong? So extensions, validation error, variables. Oh, because I inserted a bunch of beer earlier for my demo, I left my query variables populated. And so it's telling me I don't know what to do with that. So I can go ahead and insert another user there. 
So the question that we have here, which way do you prefer for writing business logic in Hazura actions or remote schemas and why? Great question. Um, so I would always prefer to use actions when it comes to business logic, because I'm giving it parameters that I want to then uh, actually operate on. Uh, when it comes to remote schemas, which is something you can add up here, and it's a, it's a great feature as well. That would be a great case when I want to essentially federate my APIs. I want to maybe take a CMS from somewhere else, or I want to grab another data set from somewhere else, or even an additional database. And I want to join that data set together, enrich that data in some way. That would be the use case for remote schemas. When it comes to actually uh, operating on the data or, or creating you know, a logical operation on the inputs, I would definitely prefer that typically in an action. And actions, again, is something pretty straightforward to define. You come in here, you say, go ahead and create an action. I can give it the type definitions of what the inputs and the outputs would look like. Uh, and then I can give it a, a endpoint to handle that and be able to uh, execute that at any Lambda source that I would want to um, operate on. So it's a really, I mean, I, I'm, I did not come up with this line. A friend of mine did uh, before I worked at Hazura. He said that Hazura are suckers for giving this stuff away for free. I think he kind of nailed it. <laughs> uh, it really is a ridiculous, powerful tool when it comes to just everything that it can do on, on gluing things together. Uh, but it's something worth looking into. Uh, the, the cloud version is the easiest and fastest way to set it up. There is like a developer tier, like go at it, have, have fun. There's like built-in caching and things, which is amazing. Um, but you can also just download the open source repo and stand it up in Docker. Uh, so there's a, a number of ways to try it out. The other question is how is Mongo support going? Any ideas when we can get early access? Uh, no idea on both. <laughs> I know that it is still being uh, actively worked on. Uh, there are a couple of other relational databases that are, are trying to be getting support <laughs> perhaps before uh, Mongo finishes, but it's something that we are still actively looking at. If it's something that, you know, there is a big need for, and there's more and more noise on the, the tickets inside of the GitHub repo on the Mongo support, uh, it does get more eyes on it when people say, like, we build things for the community. So if it's something that we say, oh, there's actually a ton of people want Mongo support, something we can look at more and more. But yeah, it's uh, Mongo support, it's a thing. <laughs> um, so when we have this API, and I'm just kind of being conscious on time here. So we have this API, so we got a mutation there that we were able to do. I'm gonna go ahead and build a new bit of data here where I want to make a connection now that maybe my user has like a list of beers that they are kind of tracking as their favorite. I'm gonna actually define a table here inside of Azura. In this case, I'm just gonna call this user beers. And I'm going to give it a ID. Uh, I'm gonna give this a UUID, which is a better thing to do. And I'm gonna just go ahead and attach these here. So I'm gonna give this the beer ID. And I need to give this an integer type because I'm just using integers for those IDs. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do a user ID and give that an integer type as well. And we'll uh, just leave that alone for now. I'm gonna go ahead and add table. I could define the relations right away here. I'll show you the, the long way around doing that. So on this user beers, I'm gonna go to my relations tab, uh, tab now. And I'm gonna go ahead and configure a manual relationship where the user's beer is going to be a array relation or a object relationship to the beer table. Uh, table. So I'm going to go ahead and call this the beer. And it's going to be going to the beer table and it's going to be from the column beer ID to the uh, ID of the beer table. Go ahead and hit save. And then I'll do the reverse on this or I'll go ahead and give the uh, user as well. I'm going to go make another object relation I'm going to go ahead and say object relation, and this is going to be the uh, user. And I'm going to go ahead and reference the user table from ID of user ID to ID and then save on that. And now that I've created this sort of a join table, what I can do is I can come into my user now, and I'm going to go ahead and tell this that I what I want is a relationship uh, that I'm going to go ahead and call. Uh, an array relationship. And I want this to be uh, beers. I'm referencing the user beers. It's kind of like a joint, it, it is a join table. 
And it's going to be where the ID of my user is the same as my user ID. I'll go ahead and hit save on that. And from here, what we can go ahead and do is go and make a, we have a couple of users here. And we can see, so we have Jesse and Jim. And I'm going to go to my API tab now. And I'm going to insert a couple of beers, uh, user beers. Uh, and what I want to do is actually do something a little bit different here. So I'm going to go ahead and actually do a subscription. And subscriptions operate over WebSockets. And we actually have support for that out of the box here. And I want to say get user beer. And I want to give this a parameterized query now. So I'm going to go ahead and say this is uh, my, my user ID. Just checking time here, making sure I think I'm still fine on time. If I get close, feel free to cut me off. And I will go ahead and uh, drill down on this. And I want to go ahead and grab a user and a name. And what I'm going to do is uh, also grab the beers and the name, uh, the, the beer drop down. Yeah, we, let's grab the I, uh, typo. Let me see here. Fun fact, I um, had a, a mechanical keyboard. I got my first one ever. And I, <laughs> I did not check the specifications and I got a 60% layout. And the problem with that is that uh, it did not have arrow keys. <laughs> I didn't know that they actually made keyboards without arrow keys. And that was unfortunate. That's for uh, Vim users though. It, right. it was, and I've tried finding a Vim user to, uh, to buy it off me. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is actually used to be int, uh, which is not integer. So we'll fix that. All right. So what we have here now is this uh, basic subscription. And I'm going to go down here and pass in uh, the, the query variables uh, for the, uh, the user. In this case, I want to go ahead and grab just user one. And we'll see when I make the subscription now that what I'm getting is uh, user by PK. So I'm getting me and then I'm getting the beers here. I'm going to copy this console here into a new tab. And then I'm going to actually insert some of those, those, uh, those um, beer or user beers, <laughs> whatever I call that table. Uh, and I'm going to insert a couple of beers here. So I'm going to go ahead and say mutation. And I will say uh, insert user beers, users beers, I'm fine. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab that array syntax again and the data that I need to, uh, to uh, pass in there is gonna be the beer ID. I'm gonna grab a random one here. I know I have roughly 80 beers. So I'm gonna pass in beer ID of 50 and then user ID, which is one. And then I'm gonna just look at what the returning uh, data is on that. So I'll run this once here, and I'm gonna just, uh, just do that by itself. When I head back over to this tab, we'll see that I've actually been inserted the beer uh, there. If I come back and I pull this tab off to the side so that you're able to view uh, the, the behavior here, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a different ID here onto a, a different beer, so beer number 30. When I run this right now, you'll see that the subscription automatically updates. And getting subscriptions like that for real-time queries out of the box is just a fantastic, like That's for impressive. free. That's incredible. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, I wanna show a, little, a few more things here where this just again, uh, a couple of cloud things. Again, we have a free tier on that. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm being very uh, generous here. Um, a couple of things that are pretty impressive. If we go to the monitoring tab here, this is a cloud specific thing you'll see that we can actually drill down on the observability of what's going on here. So I can see, for example, on subscriptions, uh, I can see that the WebSockets, I had a, an open WebSocket there running. I can uh, terminate those from here. I can see which operations were running against my service and how fast they're running. And I can do another query here. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to drag this tab back over here. And we're going to run a relatively deeper query here. So I'm going to go ahead and run a query called get 50 beers. 
And what we're going to do is uh, just run a, a beers query that I will limit to the first 50, not 590, 50. And I'm going to grab the name and I'll grab the uh, image on that. And I haven't added any relationship there, so I couldn't drill down to users. In this case, if I added the relationship, I, I certainly could. I'll go ahead and run this. Actually, I'm going to make this even harder on myself. So I'm going to not limit it to 50. I'm going to do a uh, drill down search on the name of the beer, uh, where it's going to be in, or it's going to be like. I'm going to do a like. I like. Uh, and we'll just pass in German to see what we get there. So I'll get, get German beers. Let's see if that query works properly. So that does not work. Let me try another search here. It's probably because I need to do a uh, better search here. There we go. So this is like a terrible query, right? <laughs> this is not like an, uh, this is not a performance uh, full text search forward backwards on this uh, data set. And I'm going to run this just a couple of times so we can compare it inside the system. But now again, even on the free tier with Azura, if you've ever tried setting this up on your own, you're going to know what, ama what an amazing thing this is. I'm going to just pass in a cached uh, directive on this and give it 300 seconds there. And when I run this once, I'm setting the cache. And then when I run it again, <laughs> like it's GraphQL cache that fast, we go back to the monitoring tab here and go to the operations. We'll see that our initial uh, get beer uh, queries here was running around so 747 milliseconds. And then when we ran our cached queries, we were actually getting it down to like 20 milliseconds. And that's, that's really cool. We can see the actual path of the operation. Again, this is all part of the part of what you can uh, access on cloud, but that's, that's some of the amazing tooling that's available there. I don't want to spend too much time pushing the cloud product. It's just, if you've done any of this before, if you've set up observability or caching on, on GraphQL and, and you get that out of the box, it's just uh, really impressive. <laughs> So I'm looking at my time here. I've got, I'm at 29 minutes. So I'm going to check now for some Q&A and some, uh, some chat. Uh, let's see here, is there any questions we have at this point or something that would anybody would like to see specifically uh, or if that I flew over too quickly? What do, what do we got? So this is when you create something in Hasura, do you prefer to start from the database or do you start from Hasura and then you build the database? I mean, would you create the table directly on the database or would you do it the other way around? So the, the biggest like mind blow moment is when you bring a database to Hasura. So something that your, your client's given you and said, here's your Postgres database, here's my MySQL database. And I want you to build something amazing. And like, you're like, well, your API is terrible. Dropping that database into Hazura is definitely the most, like the biggest benefit you'll see. Now for me personally on the hobby level. So again, I'm on developer outreach <laughs> and set, and I actually like to personally do things more on a GUI perspective. So I like to go into the actual uh, table, create the tables here, pick my types and stuff like that. That's, that's how I like to work. Um, but you can definitely go both ways. You can run the raw SQL statements here. You can create tables as well. If you had a, had an example SQL statement, a fun, a fun tool, uh, just a little freebie here. Uh, you guys are familiar with Makaru? Are you all familiar with Makaru? No, no Makaru people. Okay. So a uh, pretty funky little tool here. You can define all kinds of tables and whatnot. Very rich amount of mock data. Uh, so you can do something like, uh, I don't know, grab, who knows what car models, like you can grab any kind of weird data you would want to grab and you can actually export this. I'll uh, go ahead and say, I want the uh, SQL statements. And I would say something like, I want to, um, just want to go to exports or I can save the schema. And there's also an export button, I think, but uh, go back, download data, maybe. 
oh there it is include the include the create table so you can like build out a weird whatever you want to do like we can go ahead and, and just do this real quick so i'm gonna we got a first name a last name and an email address a gender um and i'll do something here kind of like password so like again don't do this but we'll go ahead and grab a th something here called the list custom list and i'll do something like dog cat uh carrot and we'll leave that at random and 1000 rows and i'll go ahead and call this um you know bad user because <laughs> this is not what you want to do i'll go ahead and download that data and if i go ahead and pull this file up now uh into into here what i can do is i can just grab that sql statement come into hazura uh go to the the data tab um i'm going to go to the data tab there we go and into sql and just insert that I think this should run. I don't think I chose any bad data types. So relation mock data does not. Right, so I had a problem here where the table I didn't rename. So I need to create table mock data. I think I grabbed the wrong, I might've grabbed the wrong SQL state. Let me grab, look at this one here. I may have grabbed the wrong one. Insert into, no, I think I did wrong. But anyways, if I created the table here real quick, you know, mock data, um, I'd be able to do that. It looks like it didn't give me the create table statement in this case, which is unfortunate. <laughs> End of their free promo. But uh, <laughs> let's see if that if that new download works. Uh, it has, it has a save this scheme as well. So that may work for you. Here it is. There's, there's uh, the statement. No I think it just, uh, for whatever reason, didn't download the right one. So let's try running that again. And for, in terms of prototyping, like getting a concept off the ground, fantastic, fantastic workflow. So yeah, executed. I can come now into the, um, the bad user table. I can see all the data. I can immediately come into my API here and I can query the bad user, get a list of, of who's there. I mean, for prototyping, Fantastic. And that flow between, you know, mod, you know, identifying your table, all kinds of random data, bringing it over into uh, Hazura, getting an API instantly like that. I don't know what, what more you, you'd want <laughs> out of that. But um, yeah, do you have any questions? Other questions? Looks like that's probably uh, just, yeah. just a, 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 one thing we should mention. I think uh, at, at least I um, had a big concern the first time I tried the uh, Hazura um, was about porting, uh, you know, any actions configuration uh, uh, I made through the console to another uh, Hazura server. Uh, you know, all the mm -hmm. metadata. Uh, so. And, and you're probably referring to then now the Hazura CLI, like that being the, yep. the path to go, right? So we yep. also have what's called the Hazura CLI, and this will allow you to be able to export all of this metadata, uh, which is which is what we refer to the, the layer of defining where your actions are and what the relations are and all of this. So you can export this into a local repository. We actually have Git deploy based now as well. So you could run like a local version of Hazura test it out, make your changes, save those as a migration uh, statement inside of a repository, push it up to, to GitHub, and then be able to actually trigger a fresh deploy of your Hazura Cloud instance if you wanted to do a Hazura Cloud instance. Uh, and that would actually apply those changes for you as well. So the Hazura CLI is sort of your, your utility belt for being able to make sure that this data can be tracked in, can be checked into version control or whatever else. Yeah. Like I said, whoever said that they were they were suckers for giving the stuff away for free wasn't wasn't joking. It's a really powerful tool, <laughs> um, and I, I mean I like the cloud version because I'm I'm the GUI guy. But uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to basically all of this kind of stuff, just with a you know a Docker Compose file as well, it's just really 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 impressive stuff. I think we got like four minutes left according to my keynote timer. <laughs> Are there any last minute questions? Do you I know where the name? Single question. Oh, sorry, Dimitri, go on. Do you know where the name Hasura comes from? Yeah. <laughs> so there's the supposedly the name 
like the the official name story is so Azra are these little like gremlin type demon y kind of characters that go run around make a muck in your code. And uh and so then they built this tool in Haskell that was helping you maintain these uh little these little and, and I think now they've they even now call it taming demons as opposed to demons. So it's kind of like a play as well. But yeah, it's Haskell plus the Azura, these little gremlin creatures in your code. And they liked how it sounded. And then the dot com was available. <laughs> I think it was available, even though it's a dot IO now, but yeah. Um, well, yeah. In, in Greece, it means something else. It means loss. When you play, when you place a bet or something and you lose, we call it Hasura. Of course, the, really? <laughs> the, the accent is different. It's not uh, as you pronounce it, but yeah, it's funny. I just wanted to ask if, if it was uh, a Greek origin for the name, but uh, that's actually it's, no, it's very cool. It's, it's a name. Vidic, Vidic demons, yeah. <laughs> if the I Greek adoption is low, uh, now you know the the reason. <laughs> you can yeah, yeah, we'll have to figure out a way to uh, spin that a little bit. Um, yeah, they always the, say, the "Do your foreign country due diligence." No, it's it's fine. As a matter of fact, it's a very mouth. It sticks. Filling word. It sticks. It's round, yeah. Mind. It's very round. Yeah. Sound, Hasura, yeah. Hasura. Um, and what's uh, not to like with the gremlins and, and all? I mean, exactly. Uh, yeah. Strato, I don't have a lot. question because I I'm, I was very scared when I was seeing this presentation because the amount of power that front end developer gets when they get when they use this platform is obscene. I mean, I can. Uh, there's probably a big conversation, a big question here about, you know, like. Do we really want it's fine? To? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> well, if you really want to have a mind blow moment, there we have a couple of videos on this too. Uh, if you look up like the Hazura TypeScript tooling uh, workshop, again, it's totally free. Just I think they want your email for that one. So pr the price of privacy, what's that these days? Um, but if you watch that, if you watch that video, the there's a library, speaking of Greece, uh, it's GraphQL Zeus. <laughs> Um, and that <laughs> will will take the endpoint that you have uh, from from any GraphQL endpoint works well with Azure too, and it generates uh, typed uh, like hooks for you inside of your code base. It's amazing, like really, really amazing, like what you can do with that. So, so I was gonna go into that tonight. I'm like, no, I won't have time. I just won't have time. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. Uh, um, cool. uh, Jesse, thank you ever so much for this. This was super enlightening and super informational. And um, I think. Yeah, thanks for having the, me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Man.